Our next session, I present to you the man leading one of the biggest hotel chains in the world, Mr. Sebastian Bazin, Group Chairman and CEO, Accor. After several years of breaking in different positions across the globe, Mr. Bazin moved to Colony Capital in 1997 to head up its European branch. Sorry, Trisha, I'm going to interfere. There's breaking news coming out. Um, Accor has just signed a Sofitel hotel in Jaipur, 275 keys with 50,000 rooms, and I thought I have to come and stop the introduction. So congratulations to Accor. Sebastian, I hope we'll hear more about that. Go ahead. Congratulations, Accor. Now let's continue hearing a little more about Mr. Bazin. He joined Accor's board of directors in 2005 and via Colney Capital became a Paris Saint-Germain shareholder in 2006 and the club's chairman in 2009. In August 2013, he resigned from his duties at Colney Capital and was appointed chairman and CEO of Accor. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Bazin. for 60 years. At Accor, we don't just define hospitality. We create what's new and what's next. Our story kicks off in France in the 60s, a decade of new beginnings. These two daring entrepreneurs had an idea, adapt an American concept never seen before in Europe. Together, they launched a new hotel brand, offering not just a room, but a complete set of services tailored to address the needs of new travelers. This was visionary. And so began an international success story with a French touch. Expanding rapidly and diversifying, accompanying changes in society year by year, continually perfecting the art of hospitality. Novotel paved the way for more than 40 hotel brands, each one meticulously designed to meet the desires of different kinds of travelers. Those looking for affordable, easygoing breaks, those searching for refined journeys, those eager for extraordinary escapes, and those craving for uniquely creative getaways. Extending hospitality even beyond the walls of our hotels, we offer lifestyle experiences, not just for guests, but for everyone. From delightful dining to vibrant nights out, from remote work to time for wellness, creating places to truly experience life. With its pioneering spirit, unrivaled know-how, and range of brands, Accor stands as a leader in hospitality all over the world. Still augmenting hospitality in all dimensions, providing innovative tech-driven services, a single online booking platform, and the most generous loyalty program building on all client experiences to nurture every guest's journey. From its beginnings, Accor has been committed to sustainability, always looking to shape a mindful approach to travel, giving back to the planet and to communities. Today, this is the great challenge of a generation, and it is still ours. Reinvention is our essence. It defines us. A team of 300,000 hardists, committed change makers, Passionate, diverse, caring, each with their own unique stories and opportunities to grow. Imagine 60 years of audacity, with always at heart a new beginning. At Accor, we create what's new and what's next. You can take my picture out. <laughs> you don't, I don't need to see myself, and you don't need to see it. Um, Monsieur Peter Elbers. There's something, for those of you who have known Peter for a number of years, there's something interesting about your venue here. It's one of those times where, I think without any doubt, India has been, in many ways, conquering the world when it comes to technology, when it comes to financial market, Silicon Valley, and even politics in England. 
let alone London. And here we are in the largest, biggest airline in India, they're asking for a non-Indian Dutch guy to lead it. It's inconceivable interesting. Well, I know why that is. Um, and I say it in front of everybody um, when it comes to airline CEO. You're lucky because Akbar Al-Bakr left. So since he left, uh, you are the best of the very best airline CEO. So I... <laughs> and, and you know what? It gives me maybe a chance. Maybe another non-Indian can make it to try in India. So why don't you accept a French guy to actually uh, invade uh, your territory? I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about many different topics, but we're going to go slowly one after the other. First, I'll start with probably what's more relevant, which is 20,000 feet. And if you are 20,000 feet, you reflect on what are you responding to? How sizable is your industry? How profitable is it? How scalable is it? And then you decide where you want to play and how you want to play. And you know, I've been in the financial world for 22 years of my life before I joined Accor. And I, I keep reflecting for the last 11 years on hospitality. It's a super, super easy industry to predict. It's a very, very easy industry to participate in. Why? Because a bit like the airline, you have 90% of the success of a hotel investor, hotel operator, is only linked to two things, and only two. Demography and emerging middle class. I am 62 years old. In 1961, the planet had barely 3 billion people. 62 years after, you added 5 billion people. It took 2,000 years to go from zero to 3 billion. It took 60 years to go from 3 billion to 8 billion. And then within the demography rising, you basically dive in and you try to understand who could afford traveling. Of course, first you travel domestically, less costly, less risk. And then you realize that the last 10 years, emerging middle class in the world grew up by 1 billion. And India is probably 25% of that 1 billion. Numbers don't lie. The next 10 years, emerging middle class will grow not by 1 billion, but by 1.3 billion. And India likely will be no longer 25% of it, but probably more than one third of it. So the entire hotel infrastructure has been invented, it's kind of odd, by four large groups, every one of them in 1960s, Hilton, Marriott, Accor, Hyatt. And many of those who being at the helm of it are very much still alive. Bill Marriott is still alive. Paul Dubreuil is still alive. And they created an offer which did not exist. And they've been riding along on providing accommodation to those who wanted to discover a place two hours away from where they live or maybe five hours flying from where they live. And you had for 50 years, 60 years in a row, 1960 up until today. I can tell you, look at the numbers. Every year passing, you had a 3 to 5% demand growth. Of course, you had a hiccup of COVID, you had the hiccup of September 11. But it has been 3 to 5%. Numbers of supply has been growing maximum 1.5 to 2%. So you, here you are, for 60 years in a row, you have a demand outpacing supply by two times. And then you end up creating the second largest industry in the world, which is travel and tourism, $12 trillion industry, 11.5% of total GDP in the world, 
12% of unemployment in the world. The first industry is media technology. So you have an industry which you can look behind you, which has been steadily growth, which has been more profitable every year passing, and which is very scalable. You just have to pick your brand, pick your partner, pick your destination. But that's not enough. Because the world is today roughly 8 billion. Because the emerging middle class is going to be even bigger. And I've been reading on the plane coming over here that for you in India, you are today 31, 32% emerging middle class population. And probably within 25 years, that 32% will become 64%. The next 20 years, I can probably write in on a piece of paper. The demand will no longer grow three to five, but will grow four to six percent. The supply will remain one and a half to two percent. Why? Scarcity of land, cost of land, cost of construction, lack of available financing, interest rate being high. It is tough to build and to open a hotel. Who are those who are going to be the best beneficiary of a demand which will be now, the next 20 years, three times of a supply, not two times of a supply. So when you digest all this, of course, those big guys, Myriad, Hilton, Hyatt, Intercon, Wyndham, Choice, Radisson, Accor, Jingjong, Waju, BTG, we're gonna get the lion's share because we have the tech, human capital, the network, the balance sheet, and hopefully the know-how. But it's been interesting to watch. And I'll say that with, if I could, humbleness. It's also easy to read. America belongs to American operators. China will belong to Chinese operator. So far, the rest of the world belongs to me. Well, notable exception of India. And when you look at what we've been going through, our core, it's um, a lot of different transformation, and I won't dwell upon it, but it's a very different company today than the one I took over 11 years ago, which was at the time 85% European-centric and 90% mid-scale and economy. Today, Europe is 40%. Mid-scale and economy is 45%. Luxury lifestyle is taking go, I mean, going very big in many different, and we went from 12 brands to 46 brands. But now let's go to why I'm here. Well, I'm here because I want to take the lead in India. And there's something which is fascinating, and I should have started with this, but I owe my knowledge, my love to this country, to one family, and to precisely one man. And he's seated just here on my left, Mr. Kapil Bhatia. You're the first person I've met when I came to India. And um, we, and it's not me, one of my predecessors, who have been extremely smart uh, of signing a partnership with you and your son, Raul. Um, and it's been a remarkable partnership between Accor and Indigo Airlines. But Peter, when I was looking at your story, which of course I knew quite a bit of it, there is so much more we can do together. And if you allow me and you here to maybe lead India as we're trying to be a leader in Europe and South America and Southeast Asia and in the Middle East, I simply need help. I need backup. I need brain. I need trust. I need comfort. I need deployment. This is one of the things which is intriguing. You have been showing the lead, Peter, you're right in terms of economy, not only the last five years, the next six years, no doubt in my mind, you are the fastest growing country on this planet, putting aside being the biggest populated. But there's something which is striking and annoying. Here we are in a market which is untapped in terms of branded hotel, roughly less than a couple hundred thousand rooms compared to three million unbranded. And here we are with the same kind of actually population as China. The five top Indian hotel operators have less than 1,000 hotels, and actually much less than 1,000 hotels, all the five together. 
You know what is the size of the five Chinese operators with the five top leaders in China? More than 25,000 hotels, hotels, 25,000 rooms. No, no, it's actually hotels, 25,000 hotels, much more than rooms. So why is it that here you are multiplied by 25 in China, and when I'm meeting with owners last night, Everybody's super pleased, oh, I'm going to do five hotels, I'm going to do two hotels. Accor, we should be super happy, we're going to do 31 hotels new. That is nonsense. Accor alone in France, which is a tiny place, we have 2,000 hotels for 70 million people. And people are telling me, we're going to be great by doubling from 100 to 200. It's between foolish or lack of ambition or lack of knowledge. Well, now you have to understand why. And I am puzzled. Because it's interesting, in your country, complexity is in between your worst enemy and your best ally. It's because it is complex that people don't have any idea how to navigate. But it's also because it's complex that even the local people are barely at 300 hotels. And even if they have at 130 hotels, it's only 12,000 rooms. So the question I have in front of you, and honestly, I don't have the answer. How could we collectively go from 1,000 hotels to 15,000 hotels and not wait 15 years? Why should we wait 15 years? The demand is there. The emerging middle class is there. They need an affordable housing. They need to discover your own country. They also need to go internationally. Well, then you dive in again. And then you say, well, there's a billion 450 people, and we know a billion of them live in secondary tertiary cities. Well, one could say, well, that's part of the plan. Why don't you go to the secondary tertiary cities and basically open Ibis Holiday in Hampton Inn? Just go to the affordable medium economic hotel. But then the problem is, in each city, you have to trust five different families who could have the wherewithal to invest. And those five families are not the same from one city to the other. But those families exist. That demand exists. Those cities exist. And you know what? Airline exists now because they've opened the hub. And you've been asking, Peter, who should come first? I'll have the answer. You go first. You open the hub. I'll come second. Because if I come first and you don't open hubs, I'm fucked. So, 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 so I'm relying on you. But since you've opened the 85 cities, take me along. Give me, I want to be your backpack. We can open in those 85 cities probably 10 hotels and cater for that domestic population. So it's, a, it's one of those questions where I was begging, asking, people of India where, and you may not need Accor, by the way. You may not need Marriott. You may decide to do it on your own. The Chinese, I guarantee you what, they will do it on their own. We just invite you to China for the last 20 years. It's only a matter of 20 years when they will control 80% of the market, and the American control 90% of their home market. And it's interesting when you look is, because it's so replicable. I told you, go back to 1960. 1960, 2000, four decades of impeccable growth in America, creating standardized hotel, affordable, no risk. They all look alike, each other, pretty boring, but gosh, it's been super cash flowing. 20 years after, 15 years after, 1975, 2010, Europe replicating precisely American model. Then go forward. What happened? 20 years after, 1995, 2020, China, replicating exactly America and Europe. What's happening now? 2020, 2040, India, replicating what works, maybe more complex, but I don't believe it is more complex, which is shy and lacking ambition. 2030, 2050, which country, which continent? Sub-Saharan Africa will replicate 20 years after what happened in India. It is so obvious 
And of course, in the mix of it, you have what's been successful in the Middle East and Southeast Asia and South America. So where we are today is a question of what do you need to make it work? Because of course, when you're navigating in troubled waters, you have to think before you act. And certainly in this country, well, I can tell you my read on it. What you need today are probably four or five different things. First, you'd better be agile, because it will not work according to the plan, i.e. you need to have adaptability. Because if it doesn't work through the plan, you'd better change your plan. Three, you need patience, because when I believe it's going to take 77 years, it's probably going to take 12 years. And if you don't have 12 years runway, then you feel sorry for yourself. Fourth, you need trust. You need a partner. No one could navigate in your country without having an Indian local partner. It is virtually impossible. You know what? Americans learned it. It's been super difficult for them to penetrate Europe. ACO alone in Europe, we have 350,000 rooms, which is more than number two, number three, number four competitor together because it is complex to go from Budapest to Bucharest to Munich to London to Porto to Madrid to Helsinki. Well, we've done it, but it took us 50 years. So when you have the agility, adaptability, and the trust and patience, then there's one obstacle, which is a damn big one. It's not money. Money is fungible. And if any lessons from the many trips I've made for the last 11 years, there's something which is interesting, and certainly opening the gate, is up until five years ago, none of us made real money in hotels. Or at least we made more money elsewhere. Since we didn't make any money, we were shy of investing. Well, since COVID happened, I've been hearing all of you, you're going to get richer and richer, because it works. Because you get a 10 or 12 or 14% return and you went from 30% GOP margin to 50% GOP margin for medium economy hotel. Why? Price uplift, demand uplift. But you know what? That's exactly what happened in America in 1980, in France in 2000, and in so many countries. There's nothing smart about it. But there's one thing, which is particular to your country, but also particular to all the development country. I believe you're far ahead of being a developed country anymore. You like to call yourself that way, but you're not. It's uh, sustainability, CSR. I uh, was listening again to Peter. You said uh, 750 aircraft going to 1,000. The good news between you and me, if you want to visit one aircraft a day, it takes you two years. If I need to visit one hotel a day, it takes me 15 years. And ACO, we're opening one hotel every day. So sustainability is the toughest challenge in your country. Why? A third of the world population does not have access to drinkable water. A third of the world population does not have access to drinkable water. When you open a hotel, as we do in Nigeria, in Chile, in Laos, in so many countries. Well, in many times, it's a water stress environment, water scarcity. What am I taking away from local community? Water. What am I taking away from local community? Energy. What am I contributing to local community? Carbon emission. I am partially impacting, destroying many places in which we venture. Then what do you do? You stop developing? Probably no, but you'd better be rigorous and honest, candid. Whenever we open a new hotel on this planet, I ask my people to do two columns before we decide to open. The first is a negative column. What am I taking away? What is my impact? And then you have the other column, which is what am I contributing to that local community? Of course, the first thing we're contributing, which is a miracle, is called employment. ACO hires every year, which is the one thing I'm the most proud about. It has nothing to do with the billion EBDA, the five billion revenues, the 6,000 hotels. That's meaningless. That company I lead is hiring the last 12 months, 
120,000 new people in over 100 countries. But that's not good enough. 60% which of those 120,000 never went to university, never had a job before. So we showing them a hand, and he said, come on board. We're going to teach you something. We're going to train you. And they leave after three years because they feel stronger. And that is fine. And we do again. And every year, we hire 100 new people, 100,000. You know what? I've been thinking quite a lot. I don't know of any other company in the world who has the responsibility and the ability to hire over 100,000 people in different colors of skin, different religion, different education, different privileges. And we're doing it with passion. So when you have the positive column, you have social. You have what are you giving to local craftsmanship? What are you buying from local agriculture? You're providing resources to a town who needs it the most. And if you have a positive net between the negative column and the positive column, and then you're being welcome, then open the hotel because you're showing that place on the planet and you're giving a chance to somebody who needs it the most. So I'm telling you, anybody who tells me we're going to double the network in the next five years doesn't have the ambition I have. It is foolish. Your country merits 10 times that ambition and that growth. But I won't do it alone. But you're going to see me much more often in your wonderful country. Bye-bye.